Well, for the panel four, uh, the moderator is Dan Tolliver. He is the CTO of Tora Network, and he's worked in various different um, areas, uh, one including he's a rocket scientist of our company. He worked actually at NASA. And um, our panelists now, we have um, Sue Hale. Uh, he's the Director of Data Scientists and Model Innovation at Scotiabank. Sue Hale Sergil. And next we have James uh, Verstra, who is the co-founder and CTO of Kindred.ai. And we have Nancy Saleh. She is the Associate Professor of Philosophy at Queen's University. And we have Roel Vertigal. He is the Professor of Human Computer Interactions at Queen's University. And Last but not least, uh, we have an alternative guest, um, Anish Mohammed. He's from India, and due to visas, he couldn't be joining us today. Um, hopefully, he's watching us um, on live stream. And so now we have Z. Do you want to come on up? And um, I'll give, I'll pass it on to Dan. Enjoy. Excellent. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you all for being here today. This is fantastic. It's great to see so many people here. So we're going to talk today about the future of AI and machine learning, specifically with respect to privacy, security, and transparency. And so maybe I'll just define those things really quickly. What, we're, what I mean by that is, uh, by privacy, I mean, is there a way that I can make use of AI, and especially of AI that are out there, without giving up my private information in the process, without leaking privacy? So that's privacy. Security, what does that mean? That means, is there a way that I can make use of, that I can prevent misuse of a particular machine learning or AI system? And then transparency means, given some system uh, and some input to it and some decision that it has made, some output, can I understand why it made that decision? And this is important because, uh, you know, currently machine learning systems are being used for things like deciding who's going to trial and who can uh, get out with just a pretrial. And if we don't understand the prejudices that are baked into these machine learning systems, if we don't understand why they're making the decisions that they're making, then we can't really know if they're making fair decisions or decisions that we would want them to make. So it's important that we be able to understand what's happening inside our machine learning systems. And we're hoping to explore what the future of AI looks like with respect to those three things today. Okay, we've got some great panelists. We're gonna have a great conversation. Uh, Sue Hale, I'll turn to you first. Uh, so on the privacy side, what, what does that look like in terms of the, the future of AI and machine learning with respect to privacy as we've defined it? So uh, let me see if this is working. Thumbs up, you guys. Up? Yeah, okay. So uh, I think privacy is an interesting one and extremely topical. Um, there is, uh, for those of you who have been keeping sort of your finger on the pulse, um, GDPR, which is the European Data Privacy Regulation is coming into effect uh, May 25th. And, and that's quite exciting in my opinion, and, but certainly quite, uh, it's going to bring about a huge amount of shift. Um, there are lots of different points and aspects to it, one of which is privacy by design in learning systems. But one of the, it provides a few guarantees. It is intended to provide a level of comfort and a level of sort of rights that individuals should have. Um, is, the pitch? Yeah. Um, is there a level of comfort for individuals whose information is being used by these learning services to provide any sort of, uh, to provide any sort of service, right? So you're going to the bank, uh, you are getting uh, some uh, product placements perhaps, or you're getting some recommendation for rates, you're getting some pre-approvals. Um, you're using a social network and you're getting advertisements, right? So your data, anything which has to do with data of European uh, citizens uh, there or people in Europe, like uh, within the constituent countries, um, regulation is controlling what kind of things they should expect to have. So I guess specifically with respect to the techniques that we have available today, things right. like differential privacy or these student teacher models, mm -hmm. can we bring those into play in both addressing GDPR and also addressing future concerns? So the one important thing I think, uh, so regulation usually always lags uh, behind what is practice. Uh, it also lags behind where we sort of feel things should be. Um, and, and in this case, I think it's taken a, an excellent 
step forward of saying, okay, we really need to be thinking about this as a first class citizen. We need to be thinking about privacy when we're learning about systems. Uh, that's been one thing which has been happening on the regulation side. Another thing which has been happening over the last few years on the technology side has been an ability of individuals uh, to be able to perform larger scale reconstruction attacks by linking data sets together. Mm -hmm. Uh, with the advent of big data, with the advent of uh, more sophisticated techniques, with the advent of having more uh, access to computational power, it's become easier for people who have some uh, perhaps intent, ill intent in mind, to be able to de-anonymize what was previously anonymous data. And I think uh, the place where this is shifting things is to change how we interpret uh, anonymity. Right? Uh, anonymity cannot be based on the best sort of, or, or the, the sort of easiest definition of anonymity, mm -hmm. the way it's been. The definition of anonymity and the interpretation of anonymity, what does it mean for your information to truly be private? Right. It has to be private in the context of a worst case adversary. Right. And when you start shifting that interpretation of what does privacy mean mm -hmm. from what is easy to do versus what is right to do right. and what is technically feasible to do, right. you start entering into the realm of uh, techniques such as differential privacy, mm -hmm. such as homomorphic encryption, right. uh, SMPC, like a number of these related things, which provide provable guarantees in the worst case. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the biggest shift. Yeah. Right, like uh, these things are important we need to really provide guarantees, but they have to be real guarantees. They cannot be guarantees in the best case. Right. Because those best case scenarios don't really matter. It's those guarantees in the worst case which really are important. And so far, anonymity has been defined on guarantees based on best case. Right. If my adversary only had access to this data, would this be anonymous? Well, sure. But the adversary has access to other kinds of data sets. Can you think of any one specific thing in the next 30 seconds that um, is an outcome of thinking of anonymity that way in the future, say 10 years from now? How, how does this impact how we think about anonymity? I think having a careful notion of what is the information content in different kinds of data sets um, will become really important. Uh, and, th and this is not a solved problem. Uh, both from thinking about what kind of biases they may be coming from the data, what kind of information is being leaked or shared for, from the particular data item, um, and what does that information truly mean? I think having a, uh, this will evolve our understanding of what is captured within data, right. uh, which will have effect uh, for ethics, will have effect for like impact on privacy, right. uh, will effect on sort of biases within data and how to deal with that. Yeah, yeah, awesome, thank you. Uh, anyone else on the panel want to comment on that topic? Going once? Okay. Uh, so, James, um, transparency and being able to understand what a particular machine learning system is doing and why it has made the decisions that it's made, what does this look like in the future? Yeah, it's a fascinating question. Uh, I asked you just a bit before we came up here, you're like, where are you coming from with this? When is this like a regulator asking? Is it an engineer asking? Um, what does it mean to explain AI? And, and you said, all right, stick to the technology, stick to the engineer. That's, that's my background, so that's good. Um, it's really funny when you asked about that because, uh, you know, historically, statistics and machine learning come out of an attempt to understand data. Like, that's what we started with. And we use these tools to find patterns, uh, we looked at tools like, you know, k-means modeling, linear regression, other things you might have seen in statistics classes and machine learning classes, uh, you know, around North America. And, you know, those, those techniques are kind of easy to understand because they were, they were designed to explain patterns in data. If you're trying to predict, you know, something from something else with a linear model, you look for the big weights, and those are the things with the strongest predictive effect on, on something that you see. So, it, so those are easy to understand. Now what we're seeing with deep learning, uh, with um, deep reinforcement learning and, and deep convolutional networks and so on, is that the same kind of uh, techniques from machine learning, if you put a whole bunch of intermediate layers and kind of inspire the, the architectures uh, from, take inspiration from the brain, um, what people have found is they work a lot better. Uh, you can use a huge amount of data, like as if you were you know, a baby learning from scratch over the course of a lifetime, and learn to predict um, you know, huge numbers of different categories, so now we have computer vision systems that are able to drive cars and recognize pedestrians, bicycles, and all kinds of interesting situations. 
And the way they do that is they make these models which are now extremely complicated. Uh, they're, they're inspired by the brain, and you know, the brain is not actually something that's easy to understand. And so these models are also not easy to understand. And so there are techniques that have been developed as now becoming a, a study in its own right how to investigate already trained neural networks to figure out um, you know, what does an artificial neuron really respond to. Is it like a cat detector? Is it a grandmother detector? You know, there are techniques that are almost as sophisticated as the learning algorithms themselves just to understand what these systems are doing. And so, you know, when we think about decentralized AI, it's a tempting technical solution to communications bottlenecks. Certainly, our intelligence is, you know, each one of us has his own, has their own brain that, that learns independent ideas and stuff. And, um, you know, one of the challenges uh, is that, you know, as the machine learning models are becoming more complicated, it's almost, you know, it's like, it's like doing psychology on neural networks. So if we have distributed systems, each little node is doing its own learning, and they're not sharing data, and they're not sharing models, and they're secure, and they're distributed, and they're responsive, that's going to come at a cost of making it extremely difficult to say, uh, you know, from a, an engineering perspective back at the home office, what this you know, autonomous drone or whatever it is, is actually going to do. You cannot say. Uh, and if you, even if you had access to it, it would be, you know, a, a laborious process in some right. cases to understand it. Yeah, yeah. Are there, so I, I think we've uh, explained why this is a worrisome topic and, uh, and that this is something that's getting worse and not better. Are there any, uh, is there anything on the horizon <laughs> that gives you hope that maybe we can reverse this trend and get more insight into what our machines are doing and why they're doing it? 